Welcome in, everyone, on a Friday at 1 o'clock Eastern time for Ohio State Buckeyes Live. We are one week shy of 52 straight with these three gentlemen. They've done an outstanding job each and every week. Hope you appreciate uh, the insight, the analysis, information coming from, from top to bottom. Kevin Noon from Buckeye Grove. Steve Hellwagon, who's so gracious to uh, post these videos on Bucknuts. That's the 247 sports platform for Ohio State Athletics. And Tony Gerdeman from the Ozone. Gentlemen, how are we doing today? Pretty good. Doing good. Doing great. Good to see everyone. Uh, Urban Meyer, of course, his um, one of his specialties was special teams and certainly always wanted that Aussie-style kicker as a punter, and it appears as though Ryan Day is following suit. Steve, we'll start with you if you'd like to jump in on the Aussie. We we want to save Tony, I believe, for last because as I, as I gather, he's the expert on technique and so forth regarding these Aussie punters. Thank you. Well, you know, this has been a phenomenon that's been going on for quite a while here <clears throat> this decade where uh, college programs have gone down under, for lack of a better term, uh, to find guys uh, who can punt. They have a, a program there called Pro Kick Australia. And, of course, uh, Ohio State uh, benefited tremendously uh, from that with Cameron Johnston a few years ago, was the punter for the Buckeyes. Uh, in this case, uh, they're going back down under, it seems, and uh, bringing in his name is that uh, Jesse Mirko. I'll make sure I got that right. I didn't want to say micro or <laughs> I've been some calling other... micro for days. I just learned it was Mirko this morning. Yeah, Jesse Mirko. And correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but uh, he'll be in the 2021 class. He's already uh, something like 23 years old or something, kind of like uh, Cam Johnston was. Uh, he came, you know, a little bit later uh, in life and uh, joined uh, the college football program at Ohio State, had a great run, and now he's one of 32 punters in the National Football League. So uh, there's been a tremendous uh, benefit from this. And uh, I know one of the ways that uh, Cam Johnston made an impact was with the rugby punt where they would roll him out. And he also had a way that Urban Meyer loved that he could just drop the ball like a nine iron on the five yard line. And uh, Terry McLaurin or whoever would get down there and, and, uh, and bat it down and, uh, and down it. So if Jesse Murko can have the same kind of impact that Cam Johnston had as a punter, uh, that would be tremendous. Of course, Ohio State, honestly, uh, you, you know, as a punter, you may want to go someplace where you get a little bit more action. Uh, their punter probably had one of the fewest number of punts in the country last year. Uh, is it Drew Crisman? Is that who the punter is? Uh, you kind of struggle to remember his name at times, but at any rate, uh, Jesse Murko will have a chance. It, it seems to be the next punter after Drew Crisman in an important position, obviously, on any team. I make light of it, but uh, field position is so important in college football. And we've seen Ohio State win games on the basis of field position uh, before. What was it? Uh, the game at Michigan State in uh, 2018 when the wind was blowing and howling and either team could score. I think it was Drew Crisman and his punting that uh, helped the Buckeyes uh, win the game that day. So at uh, any rate, um, you know, an important position filled and filled in a unique way, obviously, with Jesse Mirko from Australia. Yeah, that's all I got to say, Steve, about <laughs> everything. There's nothing left to say. What I'll yeah, say is – Saving you last. Thank you. Um you know, Australian punters are just, uh, you know, that's what all championship teams are made of. They special, I mean, I feel bad for Jim Trussell, who said the punt was the most important play in, in football, that this whole pro kick Australia came kind of after his time, because this would be right up his alley. Because if you guys remember when Trussell first got to Ohio State, he was having like scientists measure the wind from the different angles of the stadium to figure out the best way to punt and and what to do in certain situations. But back in, in that time when he you know he had Andy Groom and he had BJ Sanders, BJ Sanders, guys who were really good, they would just punt and they were good at it. But then you get these Australians, they're like trick shot punters and they can do all, all sorts of different things. And so they could have 
melded very well with Jim Trussell's punt thought mind of, you know, we've got a corkscrew wind here. So what we need is the, the, uh, the opposite of clockwise that the Australians like their toilets do. I think their punts also do that. It's, it's a whole down under thing with the separate hemispheres that makes them really good, but just the different things that they can do, like Steve said, just dropping them, the nine irons, the, the runouts, the, uh, punting it on the, on the, the tips of the, of the balls rather than in the middle. And it, they're, um, scientists basically in, in the punting game. And if you ain't got one, you better have one who trained the one you, the punter you have now, like Drew Crisman learned from Cameron Johnston. So he's, he's Australian adjacent. And so now you go from Australian to Australian adjacent, then to Australian Back again. To Australian. Right. Now now you're going to be okay. Yeah, actually the term should be once removed, not adjacent. That's geography. Sure. It's just once removed. Uh, you know, I, I did think of a point after the fact, and I know a lot of recruiting fans are concerned about how <laughs> zero star Jesse Murko is going to affect the class and whatnot and how Ohio State's supposed to sign 28 five-stars this cycle, even though at least in the rivals' rankings we don't have 28 five-stars yet. Generally fills out to about 35 or so. But ask Bobby Bowden his thoughts about walk-on specialists. Hmm. You can't take the chance in that situation. I understand wanting to bring in all of these guys and whatnot, but it all has a funny way of working out at the end that – you're, you're concerned that you got 36 guys that want to be part of the class, and generally it's more, but 36 guys within a certain cut in the rankings, it all works out. So for the people who are all concerned about that, relax, don't worry. Uh, you know, they know what they're doing. They're, they, 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 these coaches have, have, have recruited a class or two before. Well, and the Ohio State plan to win that was brought by Urban Meyer is all about field position, and that continues under Ryan Day. So – if you don't have the the battery of the, the the long snapper and Liam McCullough, I said this a, a couple weeks ago. He's the only perfect Buckeye ever in his four years. All of his snaps were perfect, and most Buckeye fans may not know who that guy is, but if he screwed up, you would know who he is. And he was on point always, and that allowed the the kicking game to be on point. And when you pin defenses, I mean, you you can go. We've all seen it in the team meeting room. They've got a, a field chart of if the opponent starts on this yard line, this is their percent of scoring that they do, and, and this is the percent of possessions that end up at scoring. And so they take this all very seriously, and the plan to win starts with field position. And if you don't have a punter, then you are going to have some issues with field position. And if you do have a punter, sometimes he's the best player on defense. Yep. And I'll just throw in regarding the recruiting rankings – um, you know, they're recruiting against Alabama, Clemson, whoever for this quote unquote mythical recruiting championship. Well, those teams every year or every other year need to take a specialist too. I mean, they're going to have a low ranked kicker or punter one or the other, you would think maybe in their class. And, um, you know, it shouldn't impact the rankings. I've long been an advocate that the rankings should only reflect the top 20 prospects in each class because some schools can sign 28 guys and some schools can sign 21 or 22. And it's an apples to oranges comparison if you're doing cumulative or average or whatever. And again, I have never gotten wrapped up in a team ranking. I mean, if you have a top 10 or a top five class, you've gotten enough guys within that class to change the bottom line and put your team in potential contention for a national championship. So if we're splitting hairs over who's number one or number two, I'd consider that to be a very positive situation regardless. I know psychologically it means so much to have the top class, but you know, a lot of times uh, that's pressure that these kids don't really need to live up to. And, you know, whatever, as long as it translates to wins on the field, that's all that matters. And uh, I continue, I'm doing this series, looking at these past classes. And uh, in the past 30 years, Ohio State's had one class that was number one, and that was way back in 1996. And it didn't translate to a national championship, although it perpetuated how good Ohio State was. 
and it allowed them to recruit guys who then helped them win the national championship in 2002. And uh, obviously uh, 2014, the same way they had in 2011, the number seven class in 2012, the number four class. And in 2013, I haven't gotten there yet, but that was the Bosa Elliott class. I think they were top, probably second or third, whatever. So you stack seven, four, and two and three on top of one another, you're in the championship hunt, no doubt. And just to jump in really quick in the Coke Pepsi battle between rivals and those other guys, we only we only factor in the top twenty in the, That's uh, good. the, the team rankings here at at sorry on this side, rivals.com. <laughs> you guys are doing it the right way because a lot of that stuff at the bottom those, some of those guys don't even have rankings. I mean, um, like Pat Elfline is an example. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was kind of an under the radar guy I found in this 2012 class, and he was ranked number 998 by 24 7 or in the composite or whatever nationally because no one had really ever heard of him. He may have been a little undersized or whatever. And lo and behold, you know, he's three year starter, All American Remington Award winner, and has now played four years in the National Football League. And yet, you know, their class was downrated because they took the number 998 guy. Under our way of thinking, my way of thinking, and what your company does, he, he his ranking wouldn't have even factored into the team ranking because he was in the bottom right. three or four in that class. And, and to me, um, you know, let's do apples to apples comparisons, is my always been my thought. As uh, close to what I would think would be uh, Dean of Ohio State or maybe even Big Ten writers, uh, Steve showing us right there the job security as a Big Ten senior writer that he can just say, hey, the other guys do it right. We don't. But uh, obviously, two very fine establishments and the at the very top of the list of anyone who follows college football recruiting, they go to 247 Sports, they go to Rivals. And those are the two that set the standard. All right. Uh, talking Ohio State football here each and every week. We've got four schedules to deal with. So I say this each week that it's um, imperative that you subscribe to the channel. Therefore, you get the notifications and know when we're coming on live. We do have some other subjects to get to, but I want to make sure that I get through the live chat and I can't progress through the live chat until we address the question. So let's get to a question, then we'll get to our our um, agenda here. So Todd B. asking, with Borland, Werner, and Browning being thought starters, does Gant, Pope, Mitchell leave since we'll be juniors? Do you see them playing to a full year? I don't I, really know what, you know, where they're jumping and we don't have the immediate transfer waiver at this point. So if you're sitting, you know, if you're sitting a year somewhere else, I mean, it's six of one, half a dozen of another at that point. I really think that we'll see a little bit more of a rotation at linebacker at this point. I could see Browning getting more of a chance to be a kind of a stand up, you know, like an edge rusher type kind of hybrid guy out there. And I won't necessarily use the terminology that they use at school up north, but something like that type of position. I don't I don't I don't see any I don't see any real reason why any of them jump at this point. You know, I've had an opportunity to speak to them in the past. It's been a while since we've had the opportunity to talk to players. Uh, You know, they're they're dying to get on the field at this point, but they're also waiting their turn. And, you know, you just need to kind of see it through. And I think that's kind of their mindset right now to see it through. Yeah, I'm with Kevin. There's no reason to leave now. You know, granted, Ohio State is usually pretty lenient on anything they could do to get immediate eligibility for the, the guys leaving. But, you know, they they are getting to play, and they will get you play more. Al Washington Washington has said that. These guys are all pretty good. Uh, so they, they're all in the two deep, and they do get to play. But, you know, they, they kind of knew the deal, like – they could have transferred after last, you know, um, after the 2018 season because the depth chart really hasn't changed much. And, you know, I, this is Ohio state. Sometimes you have to wait to play now waiting till your senior year to start. That's, that's rough. Um, but you know, uh, it, you don't, you only need to start at Ohio state for one year to end up being a top 10 draft pick, you know, something like that, or to be a first rounder or to, be a, to get drafted and you don't know that you're going to end up somewhere better 
or um, you know, what the situation will be ideal. You will be seen at Ohio State, whether you're playing 30 plays or 60 plays. I mean, look at Devon Hamilton for so long was Robert Landers backup, and then this past year just exploded past him. And he was the best nose tackle by a mile at Ohio State. Ends up being like a third round draft pick. So yeah, I, I I don't agree with the no real playing time. I think they have played. I think they'll play some more this year because they're there's they're talented enough to play and they want to keep guys fresh. So I think they'll play the more this year. But if they are gonna leave, I mean it has to pretty much be this month because that's when it happens. It's it's after spring ball is normally ended, after April. And this is when guys leave when they see the, the depth chart. But there is no depth chart right now because there's no spring ball. Well, if I our didn't friend get, Tim Harbaugh, go ahead, Steve. I didn't get the sense from any of those guys <clears throat> that we talked to. We did get to talk to some linebackers. I mostly dealt with Pope. I didn't get the sense that he's hopeless in the situation or planning to leave. And uh, when you listened to Al Washington, we did a conference call with him about a week or two ago. He seemed almost steadfast in saying that those guys will play, at, you know, as much as they've earned and almost to the point of saying, OK, the guys in front of them are seniors and none of them are leaving. Uh, here's a memo to them. Some of your playing time is going to go to some of those guys, whether you like it or not, because we need to play those guys for one reason, to have them ready for 2021. So, um, I don't get the sense that anybody's leaving. I think that they're all. I wouldn't necessarily say they're happy with the status quo, but the seniors aren't leaving. They're going to play every meaningful snap, it seems. And the juniors um, have been told directly or indirectly that you will get X percentage of snaps if you earn them. So um, it, it's it's not black and white written down in stone. And uh, I know Tony on the conference call asked Washington if he had – a depth chart and he said no although you know i don't buy that for a minute it hasn't changed one bit i mean it, it it's crazy you know people didn't like what tough borland did last year in 20 what would it have been 2018 coming off the achilles people thought oh he's a step slow and he, he can't do this and he can't do that well you know bill davis leaves greg shiano leaves urban meyer leaves and they bring in Ryan Day as the head coach. I mean, he'd been there, but, you know, elevated from offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach uh, to head coach. Then you have Washington take over as the, um, the linebackers coach. And you have Halfley and Madison are the coordinators on defense. And what a shock and surprise. Pete Werner and Tuff Borland are still playing. You cleaned house on the coaching staff. You had those guys who were sophomores at this point, Pope and Mitchell and uh, oh, Gant, those three guys. And the fans were like, hallelujah, the best players are finally going to play. Al Washington watched them through 15 spring practices, 25, 26 preseason practices, and said, yeah, the best players are Werner, Borland, and Malik Harrison, same as it ever was. New, fresh set of eyes. Watched them play, 40 practices. And those guys didn't give a crap about the tape from 2018. I mean, I'm sure they watched it to see what was going on. And I'm sure somebody said, oh, yeah, it's tough, Borland. Uh, yeah, he coming off the Achilles, he was a step slow. Still the best we had. And lo and behold, crazy. New coaches saw it the same way the old coaches did, but and that's nothing against Pope and Mitchell and, and Gant. And the other thing that you have to think about is, okay, linebacker play, linebacker play, linebacker play. The big plays that Clemson hit in the bowl game, the national semifinal game, were against 4-2-5 defense where you had uh, Browning and Harrison were the two linebackers, Borland and um, – Werner were on the sideline. So the screens and the quarterback run were against the 4-2-5. And, um, you know, the down and distance and the score dictated that Borland and Werner weren't on the field. So 
say what you will about it, but, you know, people get up in arms, we'll play the best players. Well, I think in their mind they did. And it was Baron Browning that couldn't catch Trevor Lawrence. And, and to most people, best player means best athlete. People are enamored by 40 times. And yes, you need elite athleticism to win at the level Ohio State's expected to win at. There's no question about that. But best athlete doesn't always translate to best football player. I heard that comment from Bill Belichick. We all know it right here. Uh, the, the the people with the, yeah, some guy, I, I don't know, is certain the channels. Uh, I guess he's coached a few places. So, yeah, it, it's it's obviously needed. It's required, but it's not necessarily you can take a slightly lesser athlete. They can be a better football player. And depending on position as well, that factors into it as well. But people have been clamoring for Gant, Pope, and Mitchell. It's understandable based on what we saw in particular two years ago. I don't think there's any question that there was an upgrade in the linebacking core last year. Was it elite? Probably not. But there was an upgrade. I would also say if you're looking for linebackers to leave, I think and I don't like talking about transfers, but don't forget about Justin Hilliard, who is a graduate. And when we talked to him what, in the spring or even last year, there still had to be some discussions with him and Ryan Day on whether he would be back this year or whether his sixth year would take place at Ohio State. And, you know, he's from Cincinnati, recruited by Luke Fickle. You know, so there, there's maybe some possibility there, but you know, he we talked to him in the spring as well, and he he had no intent. Didn't sound like he was going anywhere. But if yeah, you're looking for somebody, who, yeah, go ahead. Because I remember they're sitting one over right now without a decision on C.J. Saunders. Mm -hmm. So if they get C.J. Saunders, technically they're sitting two over the 85 scholarship limit at this point. So some decisions will need to be made on players and. As, as I say on my message board, I don't talk about potential transfers because you can't unring a bell. Mm -hmm. Once you once you associate a kid as a potential transfer, it, it just kind of sticks around his name and whatnot, and it really creates an awkward situation if it gets back to the kid that's like, well, I thought you said I was going to leave, and basically that's tantamount to saying that you didn't think I was good enough to play here. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't really ever mention names. I'm just saying some roster management still needs to happen. I just don't see it happening with the three linebackers that we started the discussion with. Yeah, and, what, and as I was saying, when we talked to Hilliard in the spring, there was no indication that he was going anywhere. The only reason I bring it up is because there was he, he brought it up himself that, you know, well, there still needs to be discussion. He brought it up himself, I think, at the bowl game maybe, that there still needs to be discussion on, on where the, the sixth year will be. Obviously, he was hoping it would be at Ohio State, and it seems like it's it's going to be. MSU number one fan is another rival of Ohio State who supports us here at the channel, joins us for all the live streams. We appreciate that. Predicting 0-12 for the Buckeyes here in 2020. Well, I'm here with nine high. I don't know what this guy's talking about. <laughs> um, I mean, there is a chance Ohio State could win no games this year, but there's also a chance that every other team in the nation could win zero games this year as well. So uh, I think I think it would take – no season uh, for that to happen, clearly. Yeah, if that's the prediction, then that would be closer to what reality could be, mm -hmm. that uh, everybody's over 12. Certainly. Steve Hellwagon, Buck Nuts, Tony Gerdeman from the Ozone, and Kevin Noon from Rivals join us each and every week, and it's a great Ohio State discussion, so lock it in and obviously go to their sites as well for more in-depth coverage. Uh, we talked about the linebacking backups and their uh, chance to play. Well, Kevin, uh, under Jim Harbaugh's plan, they could always opt to go to the NFL. If, if his plan is uh, implemented, uh, there would be all sorts of chaos going on, but, but maybe there's an agenda there. Wink, wink, possibly. Well, when you don't send your kids to the, when the, you know, they don't, your top ones don't get drafted at all, Shea Patterson. I mean, what do you, what do you have to worry about? And I mean, they own the sixth round. So, you know, those guys probably aren't going to jump early. So, your 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 first opportunity, you know, your best opportunity to beat Ohio State is to thin out Ohio State. It's the most self-serving BS plan I've ever heard in my life, and it's just the act of a desperate guy trying to find something to grasp onto. What a joke! What a joke! That's what their program has become—a joke. Well, it's not an NCAA rule. It's the NFL has the rule that you have to be three years out of high school to apply for the draft, 
And so he can say whatever he wants, but he's not changing the – he doesn't work for the NFL. He's not changing the NFL rule. And I don't see any groundswell from the NFL to change the rule anyway. They, you know, their players association would have to agree to that, and I can't imagine why they would ever do that and cut down job opportunities for their rank and file by, you know, making it open uh, field. Let's say Chris Olave after two years could come in and take – Odell Beckham Jr.'s job by just using two names, but you know that that doesn't make any sense. So, and, and honestly, I am a firm believer in the three-year rule because I don't think that a 20-year-old or a 19-year-old kid has any business being on a football practice field with a 30-year-old guy who's trying to feed his family. You know, I, I just, I just don't. I think you're setting yourself up for injuries and a lot of broken lives if you uh, do something like that. And it's nothing – it's not even about the college experience and whatever else. I mean, people can take that for granted and poo-poo it all they want. Um, kind of a side thought on this, and let, we'll circle back on Harbaugh, but I watched an interview with Nick Saban about – I don't know if it was necessarily about name, image, and likeness, but it was about the whole amateur professional – uh, thing and um, he said that from what they can ascertain, and I don't know if this is on an annual basis or for a guy's three or four years on campus, but in addition to the scholarship, the school probably invests two hundred thousand dollars in each guy in terms of proper nutrition, proper weight training, uh, strength and conditioning, everything that else that goes into it, and and the professional development by your assistant coach, the guy who takes you as a piece of clay and molds you into an NFL player. You're not an NFL player when you walk through that door. You are closer to being an NFL player when you walk out that door. And a lot of that is because of the $200,000 that each school agrees to invest in you. And that's something that I don't think I've ever heard anybody illustrate that like that before. That is a perfect endorsement of what this college model, like it or don't like it. I know some of us, you know, see it for what it is, uh, quasi-professional football. But uh, to me, I think it's a perfect endorsement of this is more than, oh, they're just getting a, getting a college education. Bullcrap. They're getting – firm development from the time they're 18 years old until the time they're 21 or 22 years old to take them and make them a commodity that can now be marketed as an NFL player. And I don't think anybody ever talks about that. You see these players coming out of high school and everybody likes to say, wow, that's a grown A man right there. You know who's no, a, grown not. A, man? a grown A man who's in the league? As Steve said, that 30-year-old who this is a <laughs> profession for, you know, for, for years and years and years. And a 53-man roster is not all that big. And Steve hit the nail right on the head by saying – the, the, the association is the players association is not going to want to have a situation of where these guys who are kind of maybe in the twilights of their careers and that's not necessarily talking age but just the way that these things rotate are going to are going to get pushed out for for what's going to have to end up being development projects at this point because that 18 Corey Foreman who's number one probably I think in all of our rankings in terms of uh, high school athletes here in the class of 2021 he's not going to be able to to, to walk into a program right there and 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 look like he's on the same level as any of these you know NFL defensive linemen. He's gonna ha it's gonna take time. So it's just you know I don't know. I, I I just put this to chickens being scared birds and not drinking milk or whatever. It's just the quirky weirdness of Harbaugh and you know maybe I'm a little harsh in calling their program a joke, but you know that. They need to figure something out because this guy just keeps popping off with these weird takes. And it's, I mean, I think we enjoy talking about him. And, you know, if he were coaching my team, I know I'd be cringing and just wanting him to shut up. Well, the whole grown men thing, I'm just looking at uh, like the, the number one outside linebacker in the 2021 class, according to the composite, is Terrence Lewis. He's 6'1, 200 pounds as an outside linebacker. So he's smaller than the running backs he's going to be tackling if he were to leave early. And the problem is guys like that would think they're good enough and ready to leave. Not, I'm not saying like, you know, Terrence Lewis 
thinks he's ready, but there would be guys who would think they'd be good enough to leave as, as soon as possible. And they'd have people telling them that. And when you're talking about, you know, if you get drafted in the seventh round, if you're just making minimum money, that's still life changing for most people, for most players. And so as long as I get drafted or as long as I sign an undrafted free agent contract, you know, I know I'll make a team and there's, then obviously there's no proof of that because they haven't gone to these, these lengths of the letting these young guys in yet. And there's, I'm just imagining like a freshman offensive guard leaving early and then having to deal with like Ted Washington from, you know, 10 years ago, <laughs> 380 pound nose tackle. And, and now you're easy. He's a 35 years old veteran and, and just made of hate. And now some rookie 19 year old has to try to, move him on the goal line and it's 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 a it's a terrible idea well at least these guys are going to get some money in their pocket one when name image likeness goes through or whatnot so i think like uh, yeah, I mean, it's not going to be the same as you know signing some of these deals or whatnot but i mean it's going to be it's more than just uh, laundry money that jim delaney the former big 10 commissioner loved to talk about year in and year out in chicago during uh football media days it's going to be more than than that in these guys' pockets. Well, and I think you could see a top guy earning, I don't know, a few hundred thousand, and which is going to be, you know, close to the minimum of an NFL player. And it really, there's no reason to implement this kind of rule right now, a Harbaugh's rule, the Harbaugh rule. There's no reason for it other than to uh, bring Ohio State down to your level because you don't, you're, 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 you're you remember how active and how energetic he was when he first started at Michigan, the satellite camps, the sleeping, the sleepovers and, and doing whatever he could to get a recruit. And now he's, now he's coming up with ways he's sitting at his desk thinking of open letters to write in order to uh, bring everybody down to his level. And it's like, you know what? I'm tired of trying to recruit these five-star kids. I just, I wish they weren't here. They, they just need to go away and I know where they can go they can go to the NFL and then we can, if everybody's picking from the three-star pile, then it's even. That's what the NCAA wants. They want to be even. And I, that's what I want. That's what Jim Harbaugh wants. Let's make it all even. Uh, the problem there though, is that he doesn't develop his players very well either. So. Well, NASCAR are also supposed to be stock cars and everybody's supposed to have the same thing and it doesn't work out there either. So. And, and, well, NFL and, has the salary cap. And you guys are just speaking to the, physical readiness for the NFL. We're not speaking to mental and emotional maturity. We're not speaking to football acumen. There's so much made of the sophistication of the NFL versus college football. Can you imagine from high school to the NFL? Well, going pro in anything straight out of high school, like now you're an engineer, but it's like, well, you know, I used to study 15 minutes a day in high school and now now your entire life, you know, eight, 10 hours a day, you're, you're face down in your work. That, that's any, no, no, very few high schoolers are ready to be pro in anything. We're good enough. You're going to put an 18 year old first round, eight, 18 year old, 19 year old pick of the Raiders in Las Vegas and say, here you go, kid, run around. He's a member of the Las Vegas Raiders, probably known. <laughs> You don't think for a second he's not going to be, you know, admitted to the Spearmint Rhino and places like that that he has no business being? Oh my God, what a train wreck that would be! I mean, just out of the out of the sheer just weird curiosity, I'd almost want to see it just for a, a test study. But I wouldn't want to put anybody through that situation. That's just that's just a nightmare waiting to happen. Especially now that you can get fake IDs online. <laughs> Well, and you, I mean, I saw Vegas vacation. I mean, you just sit there and you just hold up a sign and you're Mr. Papa Giorgio. I mean, come on. <laughs> the Lee Smith channel asking, what is the crystal ball for JT Tui Moloau in the 2021 class? Can we still land him? Well, I have him, I, uh... I have him picked for um, the rivals future cast to go to Ohio state. I don't have that based on, uh, you know, uh, like a definitive answer. I just think that Ohio State leads right now. Uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure for him to stay out west, either hometown UW or maybe USC, who seems to be uh, finding a little bit of wind in its sails right now, landing potentially Corey Foreman down the line, some situations like that. Uh, you know, obviously G. Scott Jr. up there, G. Scott Sr., his, his father, 
our great ambassadors for Ohio State, uh, Emeka Abuka, the running back from up there. I think Ohio State definitely leads for him as well, too. Um, you know, if it was Ohio State versus the field, I might take the field. But if I'm going school by school, uh, I think Ohio State has an excellent shot landing him. I think uh, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I think that he may be holding out until he can make a campus visit when this pandemic comes to an end and the timing, you know, could work out where he could have July or August perhaps to come to Columbus and take a visit uh, and, and see what it's all about. And that would help obviously that G Scott would be here to kind of hold his hand perhaps and help him with that. So that's good. If that's how it turns out, I think there'll be some curiosity to see how Washington does. Uh, with its new head coach uh, coming up this season, are they going to fall off to six and six? Are they going to be a contender at ten and two? Is this coach going to recruit great prospects around him to where they're going to be at the top of the line in the Pac-12 and a playoff team year in and year out? Because you know Ohio State's going to be uh, top of the Big Ten and a contender for playoff year in and year out going forward. I don't think there's any doubt about that. So it's kind of the state of the USC program is or rather the Washington program is kind of what's at stake. And I think maybe he'll want to get into October or November and kind of feel the temperature on that, what this new coach there is going to do. And then obviously USC, you know, Helton got a stay of execution from the governor, you know, this past year. I mean, it helped that they went five and one down the stretch, but then they got their doors blasted by Iowa in the bowl game. And now all the murmurs kind of re-upped again, but uh, you know, they're playing a tough schedule again this year. Aren't they opening with uh, Alabama again or something like that? So um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, USC is kind of in the same boat as Washington, you know, prove to us you're going to be a contender and maybe we'll end up there. But uh, Ohio state has got the, uh, has got the uh, the advantage, at least in terms of standing on third base as a contender year in and year out, where those others, you know, they just don't have that, that they can, they don't have that uh, testimony or, you know, experience as they like to say to, to be able to put that out there. So I guess we'll, we'll see how it plays out. There's kind of a baseline expectation in business and in life that you should read your text slash email before you send it. Uh, MSU number one fan, just a little tip for you. And, and they have, they become more likely to, to be read on air as well. Uh, yeah. Well, and, and this speaks just to be in the hunt for this, for this guy, Tony, I think you've got something to say, uh, speaks to the level of recruiting for the Buckeyes right now and where it stands. We're talking about, I don't know how many great players have been taken out of Washington state by this program for as great as it's been for decades. Uh, at this level, we're talking about, uh, depending on your service, a top 20 player in the nation, maybe the number one player in the nation, uh, you know, a top side, uh, a strong side defensive end, number one player in the state. And again, one of the top players nationally at the very top of the list, regardless of position. I think the last OSU scholarship player from Washington before G. Scott, who is from the same high school as Tui Maloa, was Kevin Griffin who is, was the, what, the, the nephew of Archie Griffin. So there was, there was a, a connection there, clearly. So it's, it's not like this is a place that Ohio State has always gone to, but it's becoming, I don't want to say a pipeline, but there are, there are openings there. And they were after uh, Sam Adams, the running back, four-star running back in, in last year's cycle as well. And they're going to continue to stay out there. And I remember when Urban Meyer got to Ohio State, he was talking about, you know, they'll go everywhere, but, if you're going to go out west, there has to be interest there. You're not you're not going to waste those resources if there's no interest. And clearly, there has been interest. And we, I remember uh, Kerry Combs talking about getting on a flight to Australia for you know I don't know a couple of hours and then turning back around. And they'll go wherever the interest is for the right players. And right now, Washington is producing a handful of players that Ohio State is very interested in, and a lot of that interest is. Is mutual. I still, you know, I, I go back to like, you know, missing out on Marvin Wilson or all of these top defensive linemen down, you know, over the years. And I, I until it happens, you know, I'll assume he goes elsewhere. But, you know, they, Teron Vincent was the number one defensive tackle in 2018 and the Buckeyes landed him. So they have a history of it, but also a history of missing out. But uh, doesn't everybody. 
Ohio State under Urban Meyer did a very good job of identifying where there might have been a, a bit of a vacuum, a weakness in terms of recruiting in an area, whether or not it was in the state of Michigan or in the DMV, the the DC, Maryland, Virginia corridor or, or, or whatnot. And maybe right now they sense a little bit of weakness in Washington right now. Uh, we don't know what Jimmy Lake is going to be like as a head coach at UW. Uh, you know, there's obviously a change in Pullman at, at Wazoo. Not that Wazoo was going out and getting the top kids, but there certainly has been weakness at SC over recent years. So Ohio State has identified there and has pushed its chips in on, in recruiting the area, and players have been receptive. Uh, you know, at this point, the only player they pulled out of there right now is G. Scott Jr., but I think that's going to be something that's going to pay off for a couple of years, and you know, at some point that Seattle area is going to, you know, they'll batten down the hatches and either SC or Oregon or UW will be powerful again and be able to keep those kids at home. But by that point, Ohio State will have moved on to another area and will will be recruiting it well. Whereas under Jim Trestle, recruiting was very well, primarily in the state of Ohio and then in a couple of areas where they would go to over and over and over again, obviously Pennsylvania, the state of Florida, Georgia, Texas, but I don't think that recruiting was as mobile under the Trestle staff. It was a different era at that point, and it's kind of crazy to talk about the Trestle era being a different era, but it was, mm -hmm. uh, than what we're looking at today. So I think that Ohio State has really been kind of ahead of the curve in the way that it's able to, to adjust and really put a lot of focus in different areas when they sense weakness. Well, and Steve has gone through all of these Jim Trestle classes. I mean, they would – like Trestle would almost brag about we only had 28 official visits this year and signed 24 of those guys, you know, where they were very targeted and, and laser focused. And not that Ohio State isn't that right now, but you it's hard to just bring in 28 guys for an official visit and you know think you'll be okay. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, bringing you Ohio State football talk each and every week. Thanks to Steve Hellwagon, Kevin Noon, and Tony Gerdeman. Please join them again. Steve's on Bucknuts, 247 Sports Platform. You can catch Kevin on Rivals Buckeye Grove. And for Tony, it's the ozone.net. And of course, bring your comments, questions to the live chat. And we talk Ohio State football each and every week, but you got to subscribe to know when we're going live. All right. Um, Oregon Governor Kate Brown announced on Thursday that the state will start to reopen beginning on May 15th. Of course, that's going to be done in phases. That may not reach the phase at which it needs to to host an Oregon-Ohio State game with or without fans possibly as of September. I believe the statement was also made that large gatherings won't be in play through the month of September. If I remember, I'm not going through the entire statement but it certainly puts, uh, Kevin, the Ohio State-Oregon game in question in terms of location and most likely without fans. Yeah, exactly. And I had a chance to talk to our publisher up there in, in Eugene, and he was very quick to say that uh, it really didn't make a lot of sense for Governor Brown to come out and make the statement at this point, and it's been a lot of she doesn't know what's going on week to week and, and, and whatnot, but it certainly doesn't bode well if this is what the norm is going to be up there in Oregon. And, and truthfully, Oregon, Washington, and California are all probably going to operate under a very similar playbook when it's all said and done. Um, it does create a lot of issues of do you sit there and have Ohio State come in, provided that we are looking at an uninterrupted season as planned, come in and play in front of zero fans, 10,000 fans, 15,000 fans? Do you move it to a neutral site? Do you move it? Do you, do you sit there and try and get Ohio State to flip-flop? Ohio State isn't going to want to flip-flop home home and home in that type of situation. Sure, they would get a they would quote unquote get a, a windfall in terms of home games in 2020, but there probably is going to be some sort of limitation as to how many fans Ohio Stadium is going to be able to hold at that point too. Plus 2021 becomes a nightmare situation with Ohio State only having four league games at home on the nine-game rotating type of schedule. And Ohio State would open the season a week before at Minnesota. So they would start the season road, road. I don't see under any circumstances that Gene Smith or Ohio State, let alone Ryan Day from a football standpoint, would agree to flipping that type of schedule. So, I mean, it, it's a mess. 
Yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. I, I hear some of, uh, okay, if they flipped the home games and had this year's game in Columbus or whatever, um, you know, some of that is kind of that, that, that government think that you can't think outside the box on these things because, well, this year's budget says we have to have seven home games. Next year's budget says we have to have seven home games. Why can't we always have seven home games? Well, this year you have eight. Next year you have six. I, I mean, that's just kind of bureaucratic thinking, I guess, that, that in a pandemic, in a totally uncharted territory, there are going to be very unorthodox solutions. And having eight home games this year and six home games next year could be one of those unorthodox solutions. And I know it's not ideal. It's not what everybody would, you know, seven is that magic number every year for revenue purposes. And if they can get eight in a given year, which they have had in the past with four home games or, you know, all three, well, it used to be four conference games and four non-conference games, but I don't know they've done it three and five, but any rate, uh, they have had eight in the past and um, just the way the quirk of the schedule. So I don't look at that as an over an end of the world stumbling block to this. A neutral site doesn't do a whole lot for me. Um, if you're going to that length, should the game even be played? I don't know. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of different theories that, oh, they're just going to play the conference games this year. Oh, they're just going to play a nine or a 10 game schedule this year. Oh, they're going to start October the 1st and the season will run through January the 1st. And then the bowl games will be in the weeks that follow or God only knows what people are thinking at this point. And, you know, I think she was premature. I think she jumped the gun. I think that what she said is something that could certainly be walked back in the weeks and months that come because she is going to be under a tremendous, I mean, if, if NCAA football gets green lighted in 40 to 48 states and she's the one holdout, believe me, they're going to walk that back and the game will be in Oregon. So I don't look at her saying that as the end all be all for something that is still four months away. I, I don't, I wouldn't cancel my reservation just yet, but um, that's kind of my overarching thought on the whole thing is let's don't, assume or say anything's on the table or anything is completely out of sort and completely off the table because these are strange and unorthodox times that we are living in and they're going to do the best they can to pre preserve some type of normalcy, whatever it may be. You know, I, I was thinking would Ohio State say you can play in Ohio, Oregon doesn't want the, the crowds. Can you, can Ohio State you know, they pay a million dollars for, for, to play Buffalo, stuff like that, you know, where that's how much the going rate is for a lot of these games. But would they even have the budget to say, Oregon, come play here, we'll give you a million dollars, but next year's game is also in Columbus. It, it, would that be some type of a solution? But um, Steve talking about you know, the holdouts and stuff like that reminds me of what you know, Kevin Warren, Big Ten commissioner, uh, has talked in the last week and was asked, did he could he foresee some conferences playing and some conferences not? And the fact that he did not say, no, I don't see that happening, means that, yes, he could see that happening and that, yes, the Big Ten could be one of those teams, one of those conferences that plays, even if the Pac-10 isn't. You, I go back to Jim Delaney would always be, very all for one, one for all. It has to be equal for everyone. If San Diego State's not playing, then we're not going to play. And Kevin Warren is like, you know, it's we. I think he said something about an independent mindset type of thing. If um, if some conferences can't play, if the Big Ten can, it sounds like the way I took it from him is that they will keep their options open and they they could play this year even if the Pac-12 can't and. Does that mean no conference games or no, no non-conference games? Maybe. Does it mean you scramble and find another MAC team? You know, probably. 
The way college football has been over the last several years, I think maybe just the Big Ten plays its season, the SEC plays its season, Clemson prepares for the playoff, <laughs> and then we just meet with the four teams, and the best wild card team out of the SEC and the Big Ten gets the fourth spot, and there you go. There's your playoff. What if Clemson and Notre Dame just play each week? <laughs> I had somebody on Twitter pose the question of, if every conference just ran through its conference schedules, we don't have a postseason or whatever. Conference crowns are just as good as it goes for. Would I be in favor of, of the Big Ten doing that? And I was like, I, you know, I've done everything I can not to have to go to West Lafayette and Bloomington every, you know, every other year or whatnot. I mean, that versus no football, you know, sign me up at that point. But I don't like the thought of a conference only slate or or anything along those lines. I mean, if if we if we truly are to believe that the that the Big Ten and its fourteen teams really only has three teams who who legitimately each year are capable of winning the conference, and I'm I'm just not, I'm not that excited. I'm not going to call out certain schools just to pick on them, but yeah, I'm not excited by some of the matchups that could come out of that. But again, compared to sitting there and watching KBO baseball. <laughs> All right, fine. I'll, I'll 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 watch them. Well, plus the issue is with the outset of the season. As this goes along, we're supposed to be improving against this pandemic, and then the addition of three playoff games is going to be an issue. After we 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 can coordinate hundreds of games to be played within conferences, then we can't add the three playoff games that are needed to determine a national champion. That would be a problem at that point. That, yeah, that, as Steve said, you make you make changes. You you deal with uh, the, the situation at hand during during a pandemic. You can make things work, and it, but but then it shows you that things don't have to be so rigid. And maybe they don't want to do that. They always want to be you know like, well, we cannot do this. And then if they show that actually they can change things a little bit, that gives the uh, that, that that shows that well. Now we can. Now we don't need to wait until the end of the, this the current contract. We can go to eight teams next year. We're adding a hieroglyphics uh, expert uh, next week to the show to help us out with MSU number one fan. Michigan will beat somebody nine H I O State forty nine T nine zero and so forth. Anyway. Uh, anything we haven't covered, gentlemen, man, we could keep this going forever. I'll talk Ohio state football all day, but you guys have to live this. So Australia. Yeah. I'm That's getting haircut that. next Friday, so I won't be on. I've already, Ohio is opening up barbershops and I've already made an appointment and sadly it's at one o'clock. So I'll see you in a, in a, oh, in a my week. Goodness. Well, that's not good. Yeah, I cut my own hair. I can see I missed the spot. I got to do it. Um, That way I don't have to keep wearing a hat. I have an appointment for 2 p.m., but I think I can still make this. So, At this point, there's barely enough water and hair product in my household to slick back my hair enough. You just – it looks rather maintained right now, but believe me, it's like – yeah. We're surviving two months of this now. Think back to where we were when this first started out. You're like, into that first week, I was like, I don't think I can make this happen any longer. But uh, we've made it two full months and, uh, you know, still here, still safe, still healthy. So we just have to keep on keeping on, as they say. I made it to Indianapolis uh, in advance of the men's Big Ten basketball tournament. Sat, made it through the first game. I was with a buddy who writes for the Toledo Blade. We both decided to go out and go get a pop and a, a pie somewhere. And that's when the uh, Rudy Gobert news came out. And we looked at each other. And we're like, yeah, this is done. And, you know, I don't think, honestly, I, when things first started kind of coming out, I'm like, oh, well, May, you know, May 1 will be that big tipping point day. And now June 1 is going to be that date. I'm still optimistic we'll have football in some way, shape, or form. I'm excited that uh, auto racing is going to get started uh, this month with NASCAR and IndyCar both starting. I think that a lot of people who normally wouldn't watch it are going to at least turn it on because it's something other than watching the uh, 2016 Ohio State Michigan game for the 17th time. And uh, I'm being a big uh, racing fan. I'm hoping that we get some new fans out of it. Slick Rick Harris wants a rundown on the offensive line for 2020. How many question marks are there? How much is is firmly in place in regards to who's going to be up front? I don't think there are many question marks. Harry Miller at left guard, 
and most the likely right yeah. uh, Nicholas Petit Frere at right tackle battling with Paris Johnson and Dewan Jones. But I think Petit Frere is the, the favorite there. Wyatt Davis is an all American right guard. Josh Myers is an all American at center there. Munford is right up there with Taylor Decker, who was a first rounder back in 2016 at left tackle. I think I think Ohio State's second team offensive line would be one of the five best in the Big Ten. I think the biggest question is Thayer's back. Um, you know, mm. just will he be able to hold up for 12, 14, 15 games? That's I think I think that's gonna be maybe the biggest concern there. I agree that Harry Miller slides into that guard position. I think that uh the tackle, the right tackle position, it will be up in the air a little bit. I think that uh, MPF probably ends up winning it out. That's just based on nothing at this point. Yeah. yeah. But uh, but Thayer's back is probably the biggest concern that I would have if I, you know, if I were looking at this from a rooting standpoint. I think the backups, if you were thinking about it, Harry Miller would slide over and play center if it had to happen, and then somebody, Matthew Jones, would probably play guard. I'd say he's the third guard. Mm -hmm. Gavin Cup would be in that mix as well. Uh, not sure. Does Enoch Mavamahi, is he uh, – I think he lines up a guard as well. Yeah, yeah he's a guard. I, th I think and that he'd be in that mix for that third guard position too. They really yeah. liked him and played him a lot toward the end. And then the tackle position, I think Paris Johnson is going to make uh, a run at Nicholas petit Ferrer. But I agree with you. The experience should be what Nicholas petit Ferrer uh, is able to hang his hat on. And then next year, Johnson would move right in in place of Munford at the other uh, tackle position. Dewan Jones, uh, whatever his weight is, I think it was 370 or thereabouts when he got there and might be in the 350, 360 range. Hard to say, probably changes on a daily basis by 10 pounds either direction, depending on working out or what he had to eat. But um, uh, I think uh, he's an intriguing guy as well who could be in that mix. And uh, so – I feel very good. I would say this offensive line with three starters coming back, I feel very good about it. And I think even if they had an injury or something happened to one guy out of the group, they would be properly positioned to handle whatever came their way. I don't think you want to get too deep into the depth, but I think we've given you a contingency plan at uh, all five spots that uh, – you know, it may not be, okay, well, who's the number two guy there? It could be whoever the number two guy is on the other side shifts over and takes over the one spot on the on that other side. So, um, you know, that's kind of how I view it as a, as a pecking order or a hierarchy of how they are within each individual position. But I think it's a strong eight or nine man top rotation, and then you go from there and you build out that depth. And the great thing about last year was they had so many blowouts that uh, backups got to play 30% of the snaps in a lot of the games and maybe even more in some of the games. So I think you have to be excited about that. All right, Buckeye fans, uh, we've got a ton of Ohio State uh, kind of program slash team analysis coming your way. I'd love to get uh, maybe the eyebrow raise or the thoughts from these guys as I run down some of these involving all college football, but Ohio State in particular. So we know about the 10-year war, Bo Woody. Well, we're going to look at the Ohio State-Michigan 15-year bloodbath is what it's been over the last 15 years. Put a lot of metrics to that involving recruiting, NFL draft selections, winning in the game, but also beyond that. Why Michigan was the 2018 favorite versus Ohio State, I think there's a strong justification for that. We're going to look at a series in which we look at when they were down, meaning we look at the elites of college football and the last period in which they were down. It's interesting to look at Ohio State football, knowing that they haven't had back-to-back -back losing seasons, I believe going back to the 1920s. Uh, I'm defining down as if you're an elite program, you compete for national championships, but that's a pretty lofty status. Uh, I'm looking at being down as as not being in competition for your conference championship, meaning seriously. And, and, and I think most Ohio State football fans, you, you, uh, I'll get your take on this, would think of the post Earl Bruce final season, 1987 through when Cooper got it rolling 92, 93 as being a down period, probably the last one. And if you, and if you have one season down, if you're humming along at 10, 11 wins, 
and you do one, seven and five, then you're back up. I don't consider that being down. It's got to be a three to four year. But even during that time, uh, as you guys well know, in 1989 and 90, Ohio State was playing for the Big Ten Championship on the final weekend of the season against Michigan. Even though that was a down time, they still had uh, two consecutive seasons playing for the Big Ten Championship on the final day against Michigan. So that's an interesting one. Bragging rights, Clemson versus Ohio State. This is kind of a new or contrived rivalry in college football, and Clemson has the obvious bragging rights. But Not I much of a rivalry. Well, we'll look at the other side as well, Steve. Of course, the Buckeye fans, <laughs> of course, have their bragging rights, and it's pretty much in every other metric that could be measured. But 4-0 and is the obvious one. Um, and then we look at a lot of replays in regards to who should have won national championships or what the national championship race would have looked like in the BCS era versus the poll era and now the playoff era. 1983 is in question, 84 is in question, 1990 when you take a fifth down to win a national championship, that doesn't quite seem uh, too kosher. Uh, who's Ohio State's biggest threat over the next five to ten years? Uh, Ohio State North, it's possibly East, or it's probably right there in Columbus. Uh, Clemson's biggest threat in a lot of other college football. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Yeah, it's not Jim Harbaugh's coaching. It's his policies that uh, if anyone would take to. All right. Great stuff, as always, from Kevin Noon from uh, Buckeye Grove, Tony Gerdeman from the Ozone, and Steve Hellwagon. And if you just love Ohio State football and nothing else and don't want to hear all the other stuff that I throw your way, we do have an Ohio State exclusive channel where I take all of these uh, conversations and slice them up into particular topics. Guys, thank you so much for stopping by. Kevin, we're going to miss you next week. You know, you can always reschedule that hair appointment. I'll I'll see what I can do, but I, I seriously I I feel like John C. Riley with my hair. I mean, just standing up the way it is, it's it's not good. I've I've got to do something about it. Good stuff. Thanks, guys. You have Appreciate got to do it. Something about your hair. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Yep. You too. We'll All right.